Hi everyone and welcome back to our next encounter study. We're looking at January 22nd. This is lesson number eight in our winter study. Scripture selection today comes from Matthew chapter five, verses one through 20. We're talking about kingdom values. Kingdom values, it's the Sermon on the Mount. I think we get three of them on yeah, the Sermon on Matthew five, exciting. six and seven. Very exciting. So I'm glad you could join us today. Again, share this video with your friends, talk to other churches in your area to see if they're using the encounter. If not, invite them to join with us. I am Reverend Rebecca Zardi. I'm the Director of Ministry with Women for the Ministry Council for the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And I am Chris Fleming. I am the Adult Ministries Coordinator for the Ministry Council of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Um, and we've been telling you about the Youth Evangelism Conference coming up in February in San Antonio. That's going to be February 17th through the 20th. And you can find more information by contacting Nathan Wheeler or T.J. Malinowski. But also you can go to cpcmc.org forward slash Y-E-C, that's Youth Evangelistic, or Youth Evangelism Conference, Y-E-C, so, and you can get what you need there, so, that's all I got for right now. All right, well, let's look at our prayer for illumination to get us going today. Holy God, let us remain faithful and be counted among your blessed. Let us be your light and salt in this world. Amen. Amen. And today our memory verse comes from Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. It says, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Give That's glory. It. Give glory. That's what we're here to do is to give glory to God. So let's talk about our discussion question because I really had to think about this on what are the fundamental values or virtues that you take from the Sermon on the Mount and what is the hardest teaching for you to practice in the Sermon on the Mount? Let's get this back over mm -hmm. here. You know, sometimes you write questions. Well, okay, so just what I wanted to bring out, the intention at least, was to bring out the fact that the kingdom of heaven is different than the kingdom of earth. Yeah. Citizens of heaven are different than the citizens of earth in how we speak, how we act, the things that we value. So, like, if you look at, if we understand the Sermon on the Mount as as a ethical document, mm -hmm. the, the purpose is not to mourn or be poor or hunger, but that in the kingdom of heaven, you are comforted, you do inherit the earth, you will be filled, you will receive mercy you'll see God, and you'll be children of God. And I think those, then, are the fundamental values and virtues, maybe, mm -hmm. is what I was trying to say there. Okay. So do you have one that's harder for you to uh, practice? Um, depending on how you define meek. <laughs> yes. Is a little difficult. Yes. On occasion. Sure. Because um, if meek means something similar to humble. <laughs> <laughs> that one's a little hard for you to get a hold of. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what about you? you no, know, I, I would say meek was probably mine, too. <laughs> okay. So maybe guess. we're on the same page with that one. Right. That that whole humility thing, maybe that's, It's very know, difficult. Some days it is tough. Especially when you put it in the context of, like, it's just not meek for meek's sake or, like, a right. characteristic of humility. But I think even in Jesus' world, it's when you're in conflict or when you're disagreeing or when you're trying to minister, sometimes... There's this overriding yeah. desire to want to be right and not just what? minister. Yeah. Be right? No, none of us ever want to be right mm. all the time. That's terrible. <laughs> okay, so now we're jumping into the introduction here. Manifesto yeah. is, is the term that you used for this. Yeah, the reason I use the term manifesto is because, like, in our political day right now, you might have heard the term manifesto a couple different times. Uh, throughout history, we've used it. I've got an exam or a couple examples. You have like the Socialist Manifesto from Karl Marx, mm. and that's still influential today. You have just different manifestos. I've got one in here. Well, the Declaration is the Rights and Citizens of Man. That was a document for the French Revolution, um, written by Lafayette, and a lot of the work was Thomas Jefferson too. Just in case, but and then you got some of the maybe not so well known ones. The um, what is that? The uh, Ted Kaczynski one? Yeah, the Unabomber yeah. Manifesto. Probably know the Unabomber Manifesto, sure. but it's Industrial Society and its Future was one. But the point of these manifestos is, is that they lay out 
what what a group or what someone is trying to say this is important and this is how this is why it's important and this is how we're going to carry through our vision right and that really so you probably have heard that yeah. the sermon on the mount is considered a christian manifesto yeah uh, and so that's um so you say it's a unique document or, or a unique sermon that helps inflame the imagination and passions yeah and that's what a manifesto is supposed yeah. to yeah so it's supposed to really get you excited about something which is it which is interesting because when we look at the sermon on the mount being that it's we talk about the kingdom of god being an upside down kingdom Mm -hmm. it displays values that the world doesn't think are the are the right values to display and yet the kingdom of god is saying no these are the better values to display so we have this upside down kingdom so it's supposed to help us have this passion, this excitement, this joy, and in these values that the rest of the world is telling us. And it's a challenge strange. to what's acceptable. Sure. Or what is accepted. And I've got in here, and I think this is the neat thing about the the Sermon on the Mount. You can be the most progressive person in the world, and you're going to find a whole lot of material. Yeah. You can be the most conservative person in the world, and you're going to find a whole lot of material. You're going to find some of these things in here that are hijacked by different religions or non-religious people or whatever because there's something in this that has a complete vision of life that does think, you know, this is good. Right. And, you know, so in that sense, it's a really cool, it's a really cool document. Yeah, absolutely. Which brings us into our exploring the scripture. You say the sermon lays out Jesus' understanding of how to properly understand the law, how to live an authentic God-honoring life, and calls for a commitment to Jesus and Jesus' teaching. Yes. So this is a call to the people. And this is, if I if I remember correctly, and I could be wrong, this is the first real written sermon that we have of, of Christ, yeah. correct? Yeah, I think what I get, it's so Matthew, you can kind of see is once Jesus' ministry starts, there's about five major teachings, uh, and so you can kind of divide the book into that. Um, and so this is the first one. And so in a sense, this is this is what I'm about. Follow me, uh-huh. and you're going to get glimpses into the life of Christ and how these things play out. And then also, again, every single, pretty much every single major point in the book of Matthew is a, a call to action, yes. a call to choice, a call to follow Christ. Yep. And this is no difference. No. So we have uh, Matthew attributes here two quotes from Isaiah describing Jesus' ministry. Yeah. And they were from Matthew four fifteen through 17, which you can read there at the bottom of page 38. Yeah. And so we have this, this whole beautiful thing that Jesus is talking about. But again, it's always an understanding of what he says, that I have come to abolish, not to abolish, but to fulfill the law. Jesus is the culmination. Right. Of the law. Yeah, again, that's important just because you don't want to. The Old Testament's still intact, and Jesus is trying to say you can't understand what I'm saying without this. Christians, we've talked about how the Church of Christ sometimes just completely ignore the Old yeah. Testament. But Jesus is saying, no, this is like where I'm coming from. Like if my story is back here, the teachings are from back here. Mm-hmm. What I'm trying to make new is how you understand them. Right. And how you how you live by them. Right. What you can, yeah, so. And that was really the Sermon on the Mount then, all these, what we would call the Beatitudes. Correct. These are all the, the kingdom values, the displays of what we should be looking at are important and, and things that we should be doing in our everyday life. Yeah, and that's further illustrated. I think it's, it's important that we see, like, the Sermon on the Mount probably was not a mountain. No. It's probably the Sermon on the Hill. Right, right. But. Uh, what Matthew is trying to do, Matthew is trying to make some obvious parallels between Sinai and Moses, Mm -hmm. this teaching, and and Jesus. And so we are supposed to understand it as something important, right? Right? It's not just a, it's not a hearsay thing. Matthew's putting this in here as Jesus saying this is important stuff. It's as important as Moses and the Ten Commandments. Right. And so I'm not, you know, but not trying to, not trying to replace it. Uh, And then, um, Peter bring, picks up on this imagery where um, you're a chosen people, a royal uh-huh. priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. These uh-huh. are all things that uh, apply to Israel. So Moses yeah. bringing down the Ten Commandments, God would define the Israelites as a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and his own people. And so now we're seeing this being expanded. Yeah. 
And so again, going out to all people, like we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, that we're we're having all people that are, it, it's across all the national, ethnic, and geographical boundaries. Jesus is inviting all nations into this relationship. Yes. With him. Yeah, absolutely. And so then you say one difference between the Pharisees and Jesus is their understanding of application law. So we've talked quite a bit about the Pharisees lately, but they focus on this external, you know, I didn't murder, right. which is good. I'm glad you didn't murder. But then Jesus is helping us focus on the internal. Right. He's taking it from the external to the internal motivations of the heart. Yeah. So your discussion question is, what is the difference between the way the Pharisees understood and lived out the law compared to the way Jesus taught the disciples? Do Christians use the gospel in the same way the Pharisees used the law? First question, or the second question, yes. Yes. Like, it is so easy for the gospel to become law. Sure. Like, absolutely. this is the don't drink, cuss, or chew, or date those who do kind of thing, <laughs> where your <laughs> cultural mandates are more important than yeah. what um, what it says in Scripture. Or, I don't know, think of just any stereotypical church lady who holds their nose up at the kid who comes to church that hasn't had breakfast and eats all the donuts. Uh And instead of having compassion, you instead think, well, that's not how you should act. Uh Right? Like, and true, like, I don't want to pick on that too much because it is frustrating when you spend $20 and one kid eats and nobody else does. Right. I get that. But I'm just saying, you can tell an attitude of a heart as opposed to, uh, a desire to do ministry. Like sure. if it's a bad heart or I don't say bad heart, misguided heart, maybe. Um, and so we, we have this theory that the gospel is pretty easy. Jesus Christ died for you. Right. That's it. Sure. That's actually the gospel. That's amazing. We don't leave it there. No. And so we, we, don't. we construct things around that. Yeah. You know, we put in our own little rules and regulations and exactly what the Pharisees and, did. Yeah, Absolutely. So what I would say is Jesus then says, look, before Paul even says it, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is saying, live higher. Mm -hmm. Don't be, you're not constrained by the law to not do better, right? but by the Spirit or through following me, live a higher plane of existence. Um, And in the Beatitudes, uh, I mean, it's a backwards way of saying there's more to life than this. Yeah. Like, sure, you're hungry right now but be filled with god Mm -hmm. right don't Mm -hmm. don't settle for just external right right absolutely so that's a great way for us to teachers look at this and and try to understand how where are we at in our class where is our class at where's our congregation at how do we see the community around us? You know, are we using the gospel as as a Pharisaical law and adding all these rules and regulations, or are we just preaching the gospel? Right. Which Jesus Christ died for you. So let's dig a little deeper in these uh, beatitudes. These are these are things that most people should be familiar with. I mean, these are things that we quote okay. all the time. Um, sometimes it's hard to understand exactly what's being meant here. I yeah. think. Um, but you say that first, uh, Luke does not record all the Beatitudes. Right. So, but Matthew has added some spiritual qualifiers to these. Yeah. Maybe. Um, yeah, it's spiritualized for some mm-hmm. reason. Again, it might be because Matthew is talking to the Jews who, you know, have a default spirituality. Right. Um, and so he has to clarify. But Luke, uh, writing to the... Um, the Gentiles. The Gentiles. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're not as care to, caring about certain spiritualities, and maybe they're not uh, thinking the same thing. But Luke, so the example is, in Matthew it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Mm. And then Luke just says, blessed are you who are poor, right? And doesn't try to spiritualize anything. Sure. I don't know exactly. I mean, it, I think we have to compare that because I think there's an intention behind it. Sure. And again, I think it has to do with audiences, or it might have to do with purpose. Maybe Luke was really... Um, maybe Luke's gospel was uh, Gentiles, poor Gentiles, outcast Gentiles, maybe. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but both of these folks, Matthew and Luke, are trying to connect with their audience sure. in a deep way. Yeah. And so take it what you will. I'm, I don't think you have to necessarily have a 15-minute interruption for class, but there are just differences in those. Sure. And then next, Jesus talks about salt and light. Yes. So we have this 
we, we've, and we've talked about this quite a bit lately. Yeah. We have this idea that we're supposed to be the light on the hill, that we're supposed to be this example to other nations, that we're supposed to be salt. We're the ones that are supposed to help preserve and, and flavor the world around us. Um, and you say that there's supposed to be such a shining example that the nations would stream to it in the worship of Yahweh. That comes from Isaiah chapter 2, yeah. verses 2 through 3. So instead of sharing the blessing of the law, they use this this law as this point of pride against the other nations. Yeah, have you ever had, to, have you ever like uh, maybe ordered something that was already pre salted and mm-hmm. you didn't taste it and then you put and some more put salt, salt on, on it, it? And it's what? Terrible. Mm-hmm. It's really bad. And I think maybe the Pharisees were being a little too salty in uh, the sense of it was just overdone. Like sure. it was useless. Sure. It was so draped up in Jesus and Jesus, or not Jesus, but Yahweh and Yahweh talk and how righteous they were. And it was just, you're good for nothing because yeah. you're just trying to be too salty. Like there's mm. no there's no use of it. That's a really good point. Um, and then contrast that then the way Jesus is talking uh, in this Sermon on the Mount and these the Beatitudes and being salt and light is no, like you're going to be just what is needed. Yeah. If you're going to be a servant, you're going to be, you know, you're going to, you're going to participate in um, helping those who are poor in spirit, Mm -hmm. comforting those who mourn, filling those who are hungry. Yeah. Right. So like, that's how we show our, our understanding of the law. Right. So we're not supposed to be like the Pharisees and and overdo, but just add enough. Yeah, and maybe get the right things right. Yeah, yeah. like the purpose be of being so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, that's great. So the reflection question was: Has there been a time when you were suffering from an earthly discomfort, such as poverty, mourning, hunger, persecution, but at the same time experienced spiritual growth? You go first. Okay. This is a great question. I love this one because there's been several times that I can think of in my life uh, when this has happened. Um, One time, my family and I, uh, my husband was out of work, and I was doing the best that I possibly could working, I don't remember, a couple jobs at a time. And one of the couples in the church that I was attending at the time, um, they had called me, and there was a... um, food giveaway in the community we had a community garden um, that was run by the local detention center and they called me and they said hey we're we're going to the garden to pick up some vegetables today could you and your family use some because they knew my husband had been out of work and I said absolutely because I was working and I couldn't get there during their open hours I said that would be fantastic I can meet you on my lunch hour um, you know and pick up the stuff from you that would be great and when they showed up I was expecting like the bag of vegetables Mm -hmm. right well they had gone to the food pantry as well and they had not only got the the bag groceries but then they brought me just a, a ton of groceries. Your from, cup from, runneth over. It did. And I all I could do was cry because mm-hmm. it was such a, a beautiful, moving moment, unexpected, um, but so appreciated that that it was, for me, it was spiritually moving and growing because it made me recognize that that this isn't just for me. This yeah. is this is was a building up of the community. You know, yeah. this was a caring for the people around them, whether they needed to or not, because they loved Jesus, they loved other people. And and that was a great example for me to continue that in my own life. Um, two things I guess that come to mind. I mean, like I've never been poor, poor. Sure. Like my parents have always helped me out. I've never been in danger of missing a meal. <laughs> And no all. pizza, you yeah. know, goodness. But I do remember when I first moved to St. Louis, I just didn't have any money. And I didn't always just want to call my mom and dad and say, like, hey, I need this or that or, you know. And so there was a period where, again, not poor, but ramen was used quite a bit. Sure. You know, cheap frozen pizzas and going to the library instead of, you know, Blockbuster or whatever. I mean, yeah. like, you just couldn't go out and have a big time. Um, that helped me because I realized... You know, life is just more than uh-huh. having things. But then also maybe around that time, and maybe I've done this until I got married and then had kids and all that just there was some some loneliness um, because I was, you know, single for 32 years. And all. Sure. And so there were some times to where maybe I had to 
Which wasn't bad. I mean, it made me think about, you know, made me think about my relationship to God, my relationship with others, and, and all that jazz. And so that was that was something I think that I spiritually grew, um, and and it's helped me a lot. I don't desire yeah. great. I mean, I don't have to have friends. Like my life isn't plus or minus because of friends. But sure. I like them, but I mean, I'm not going to go home and cry. Sure. You know, if I'm not picked as the prom king. <laughs> so there's that. But it's a great way to recognize loneliness in other people then, yeah. too. You know, when when you can recognize where you've been, understanding yeah. where they are. Yeah. What a beautiful thing. So let's learn from our scripture today. So in thinking about how Christians are supposed to live and act, we get a clue from Jesus when he states in Matthew 5.20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And I like how you point out that the goal of this law was not to just keep from committing sin, but it was to live this life of righteousness. Of righteousness. Yeah. I mean, the purpose of the law, if what Paul says, Galatians or Romans, I mean, the law came so that sin may abound, actually, just to show that you were sinful. I mean, like, just in case you didn't know, like, reminder, you're terrible. Uh, And so, in that sense, the law was never meant to create righteousness. It was to expose righteousness and then maybe restrain you from being worse. And so, that's not what Jesus wants to happen. What Jesus wants to happen is that you go from not even worrying about the... I mean, like, you, if you're training for, like, anything sewing, playing baseball, whatever, you train and you get to a level to where you have to remember the fundamentals. But once you master the fundamentals, you fly, right? Sure. Playing yeah. piano or whatever. I mean, like, um, life, Jesus wants your life to be good enough to where the fundamentals are there, but then you can you can improvise. You can fly mm-hmm. like a pianist, you know, know the fundamentals. Just man. But man, then you can just take it and run and fly. Yeah. I mean, that's the... Thing. And so that's what Paul, when he says live by the Spirit, there's no law against love. There's right. no law against friendship, peace, kindness, generosity, whatever there may be. Um, and so that's what Jesus was meaning. You have the Pharisees that were being meticulous about making sure they didn't overstep one mm-hmm. boundary, but they were horrible. Yes. And instead, Jesus says, no, man, fly. Right. And just, it's fun. You get to point to where doing good is fun. Yeah. Being righteous is fun. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Which is where when Jesus exposes this unrighteousness in the Pharisees, he, he uses these great examples because he goes back to the Ten Commandments. And he says, you know, thou shalt not kill. Like you have heard it said that thou shalt not kill. But I tell you that if you're angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to judgment. Yeah. So it's, it's more than just that physical external that we were talking about. It's the internal motivation. It is, it is the fruits of the Spirit, these... Yeah. Joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, gener- generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Yeah, that's the it's, opposite of killing. It is the opposite of killing. If you're if you're like this couple that helped me and my family out, if you're generous, you're offering life. You're offering love. You're offering this beautiful, caring nature mm. that is the absolute opposite of murder, yeah. which is an amazing thing. And he tells another one, he says, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in her heart. So you talk about some counseling sessions here that you Yeah, had. you know, like, if you've been in this marriage, I mean, it's not, an, I mean, I think 50, you know, depending on the generation, anywhere from 48 to 57 percent of a generation has been divorced. And, um, you know, some of it's from marital unfaithfulness, some of it's not. But I mean, like, I've had counseling sessions where I've, sad and there's not been a technical violation of adultery but one spouse is, has no desire to be with their their spouse uh-huh. they're they're done like and they're, they're emotionally just, checked out they're emotionally checked out and they're just waiting for the paper to be signed so that yeah. then they can go and not technically commit adultery sure hmm it's pretty much there yeah right it's and pretty so, much the same thing i mean and so that's what christ was trying to say like mm-hmm. so just refraining from adultery is far from um, expressing faithfulness, love, and joy in a marriage. Right. So. Yep. And then the next one he we use get an example is not swearing falsely. So don't be a false witness. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Yeah. So that's a yeah. combination of those two commandments yep. from the Ten Commandments. Because like, you know, the technically don't swear falsely. You, know, you hear this refrain, 
You don't use God's name, number one, if you use God's name for a false swear. Yeah. Then you're taking the name of the Lord's t- name of the Lord in vain. And then if you're lying, right. you're doubling down. <laughs> but, I mean, there's a different way to live. We live in such a way. I mean, I've got to a point to at least in some of my relationships, if I say, yeah, I'm going to do that, I don't have to be like pinky swear. Right. Like, right? Right, yeah. Like, it's I promise just, I'll pay I'm, you back. I'm going like, to do this. I'm just going to do it and yeah. people take me at my word. Right. Which is, which, which is a beautiful, you know, that's that's something I think that we have lost. And maybe it's over, over the time that we have lost that. Where we could just take somebody take a handshake, word, you know, yeah, handshake and and pre-COVID, yeah, <laughs> fist, fist bumps bump. today. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> there we are. But this is this is what Christ is getting at when he is doing this teachings is that there's it's a deeper level. It's not it's not the surface that you're looking at. Which when he goes into the next one in Matthew five thirty eight through forty two. He talks about, Jesus talks about revenge and love. He brings up these old, the law of revenge, where it's a life for life, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But there's, what Christ is saying is there's more to that. Now, well, I would say the background of that is, like, yeah. we read back on that, and, and we think that's a mean phrase, eye for an eye. Well. Which, in, and we, sure. we compare it, we just say that's like a mob justice type thing or something. But, I mean, like, back then, that was a grace for a couple different reasons because like if, for instance if a king wanted to you know depose of an enemy mm-hmm. they could make up some stuff and then they could be like all right off with his head or if you had a slave and and you thought they stole from you then you could like cut off their hands or like kill yeah. them or whatever and and so actually the law for the eye for an eye or the lax talionis was a way of practicing grace to where even if it was a slave that was accused of stealing, the most you could do was get the just thing. You couldn't kill them. Sure. Like, if they didn't kill you, you couldn't kill them, right? Right. And and so, like, uh, it it was a way of, of bringing some equity, I guess, into, into the court because a lot of times somebody, you know, might get treated if it was an important person sure. and they killed a slave. Yep. They'd be like, ah, you know, yeah. it happens. Uh. Couldn't believe that. But no, now under law for law or eye for eye, Everybody was considered the same, yeah. and you got the just just punishment. So that was important. However, Jesus says, practice grace, maybe. Right. Forgiveness could be. Forgiveness? A... What? Wow. So instead of seeking a maximum penalty, a, a Christian could say, you know what? I forgive you. Yeah. You know, and then that's uh, that's good redemption. Uh, like, uh, you forgiveness know, is good redemption. And today, if you've ever watched any of those court shows where somebody was murdered a son or daughter and you watch the parents who come up to the accused who then yeah and just offer a hug and tell them that they forgive them to me that is so incredibly moving and i it 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 makes me think what is that True grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Yeah. If you're, what does that mean? Yeah, if you're an aspiring documentarist, documentist. That, that's a. You know, I don't know whatever. I'm not sure, but I'm. I'm I would to do love one of for somebody to do like a documentary on those court cases that have been known about how the forgiveness of families or yeah. whatever, of, of just to see how how life plays out. If maximum justice produces, yeah, uh, a repentance or or rehabilitation or if it's grace that brings it out. Mm -hmm. And then you close out this section with Jesus talking about love, Mm -hmm. Um, that we're not, we are to love not because people are worthy of love, that they're worthy of love because they're created in the image of God. You've probably had a conversation with Dave Laneve. Oh, yes, yes. So one of the, the Dave Laneve, my brother David, I don't know, you're probably not watching this, but somebody that you've been their preacher is watching this. And um, one of the things Dave Laneve says when he signs off on a phone call, I love you and there's nothing, nothing you can do about it. it. Yep. And I asked him about it one time and he's like, well, I love because of me, not yeah. because of you. I love you because I'm filled with love. Yeah. Like right now. Uh, and I think that's what we love God because God first loved us. Amen. God's love is in our heart. We can return that love back to God, but then we can also, from the overflow of our hearts, 
not by restraining from being evil, but because of the overflow of the love in our hearts, we extend that love to others. Yeah. What a beautiful thing that we can do. So you asked the discussion question in this section. It says, does this section help you understand what Paul means when he writes, if we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit? I'm just going to say, if you ain't got it by now, you ain't getting it. You know, <laughs> my goodness. Let's live by the Spirit. <laughs> no, I mean, I guess that's what I mean. We're not, yeah. ultimately, if somebody asks that question, it's that the law does not restrain us from doing good. No. But that's what the Pharisees did. They were just careful to obey the law but they never went that much over it. So Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that, heaven ain't for you. Right. right. Yep. So let's apply this to our lives. So probably in your Sunday school class, you have people of differing points of view, maybe yeah. different ways of doing things. Um, depends on where they grew up. I know we've talked about that. Crazy stuff y'all eat. Yeah, yes, or the crazy stuff that we all eat. I won't even get in on lutefisk because that's like a whole nother. That doesn't sound good. Well, no, I don't want to eat it either. But that's another thing. So you have all of these different ways of, of doing things. And I love this example that you did about the sweet tea because yeah. that really cracked me up. Where I'm from, we did not have sweet tea. Didn't even know what it was. No, had no clue. Didn't even know you had unsweet tea in the world. <laughs> I was just, that was just what you drank. That yeah. was just tea. But this is what Jesus is trying to tell us through the Sermon on the Mount is he's giving us a whole nother set of values Expected and ethics. Yeah. yeah. Just how, how do we live? Like we're going to be completely different. Like when you're part of the kingdom of heaven, you love different, you live different, you're different. Yeah. And, uh, and really never the twain shall meet in a lot of ways. But, right. Uh, but I like how you point out too that we're to forsake the world's customs. Forsake the custom values of the nation surrounding Israel. That's what they did. Yeah. And that's what we're to do. As, right. Like I said, Matthew does his job. You have the nation of Israel failed. Jesus succeeds. But we have a new Israel in a sense. Uh -huh. um, and one that's going to be faithful in the church. So. Uh -huh. So our discussion question to close this section out is some theologians use this term upside down kingdom. Do you think the values Jesus represents in this chapter are upside down? Well, because Jesus presents them and Jesus is God, then yeah. no, they're perfect. Sure. But no one goes down. Right? That's true. They are upside down because you the poor is not valued. Right. Vulnerability to where you can be discomforted is not valued. No. And so, but then Jesus says that's also where you can grow. Yeah. Like that's the shaking point. You know, sometimes you gotta be shaken out of your stupor so you yeah. can that's those that might be how God shakes. Right. Mm. Is to display these values. This this different way of thinking instead of looking at the world around us in in the ways that our society is structured that says only the rich are powerful yeah. and only those who have all these things have any kind of influence to understand that every person that's made in the image of God has power and influence and that each person is important and should be listened and valued. Um, you know, this is this is a great way of looking at the world around us. All right. That's all I've got this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, you can share this with everyone. And thank you for joining in with us this week. Thank you. And so go preach well. I'm going to try to think. Let's see here. Uh, let's just go out with um, preach and teach with boldness. And uh, extend the gospel of peace to, to all people this week. So we'll see you tomorrow, uh, next week. Next, next week. week. Bye, everyone. Bye.